Namco Bandai's Yokai no Chuki for the Famicom, otherwise transliterated as the Spirit Travel Journal, circa 1988 and a direct port of its original arcade counterpart, otherwise released in other territories as Shadowland. What do you know, another importer on our hands. And yes, I know Jew Wario made his own review a while back prior to his death, but now, guess whose turn it is? So the plot revolves around a deceased kid turned ghost by the name of Tarosuke, who's been banished to Jigoku, aka the spirit world if you will, despite clearly translating to, uh, I don't know, hell, for causing all sorts of mischievous bullshit in the living world, aka our big blue earth obviously. The spirit world that Tarosuke, capable of spitting out key bullets, traverses through, is inhabited by all sorts of monsters and supernatural beings. But his true reason for being lies within reaching a Buddhist deity referred to as Yama to judge young Tarosuke's final overall fate. Whether or not he'll end up in heaven or hell, or any one of the three in between purgatory realms for that matter, is up to him alone. Regarding the gameplay, it's a standard yet quirky as fuck run and gun platformer involving the control of Tarosuke as he ventures his way through the spirit world, aka hell, or more to the point, the afterlife, and its five central regions the entrance to hell, the path of penance, the sea of seclusion, the valley of judgment, and the world of samsara. Control wise, the D pad lets Tarosuke haul ass anywhere, not to mention emit a supercharge on its key bullets via down, but if I were you, I wouldn't even exhaust him too much. <laughs> Yeah, see what I was getting at? Slug summons his spiritual ectoplasmic companion, Mon Motaro, especially during every end boss confrontation, for which a Demon Charm scroll is required. And of course, you can buy an extra one at shops in stages 2 and onward, while BNA lets Tarosuke Lugi Huck the normal key bullets and the aforementioned supercharged variety after once again holding down and jump individually. Various items including extra cash, specifically bags of either 500 or 1,000, and or mahogany boxes of 5,000, are summoned upon the demise of every inhuman creature standing and or floating in Tarosuke's way, and you can optionally gamble your ass off upon facing a giant bouncer toad, but be careful as you may end up losing amounts of what you've gathered if the results are wrong. Shop for extra items and or pray for much improved physical attributes at temples, whether it's Tarosuke's spiritual worth, awarding him 3,000 piousness points, his key bullets, or his jumping ability, and always tap B and A with all your might and speed to ensure that your prayer is completely granted. Tarosuke, of course, has a life or power meter at the top left, and should he endure way too much enemy contact or exposures to any environmental hazards, it's an instant game over, but you can continue from where Tarosuke got his ass handed to him in his previous quest, despite being forced to do so from the beginning, and in the process, losing 3000 piousness points every goddamn time, therefore any pissing about is ill motherfucking advised. advised. Yet again, itinerary-wise, Tarosuke starts off his quest from the entrance to hell, gambling with that very same eyepatch bouncer toad, and when the two dice blocks land, displaying a number of dots, it'll determine whether or not you picked odd or even beforehand, thereby awarding you extra moolah if you're successful, or deducting what you bet in advance if you fucked up. Prior to facing even more adversaries, and the first of many Oni guards that summons other ghosts, The Path of Penance, where you're introduced to the first of many shops, where you can not only fuel up our young hero before sending him on his merry way via one of two Jigoku special meals, but also purchasing special items for important trades. For instance, the manju for a mutant dog you'll meet later by the name of Gonta and or the Nymph Feces. Yes, there's actual shit in this game, not to mention a double and or triple key bullet enhancement, allowing Tarosuke to summon up to either two or three of his bullets at a time individually, an extra demon charm scroll to summon Monmo Taro for future boss altercations, as hinted pre Previously, the quote-unquote Carl Lewis-style super speed potion that allows Tarosuke to travel much faster than before, and even the frog flippers, or kappa flippers, for better mobility in any body of water. As well as the first of several temples where you can improve Tarosuke's physical and spiritual capabilities, as also hinted previously.
plus a host of more demonic apparitions, especially the much bigger and more resilient types who make even the Hammer Brothers look like pansy-ass bitches, and a few new friendly beings alike, some including an owl at her end, will help Tarosuke regain his life. and a half-naked bather girl will award him a heart for an instant post-death life recovery before reaching the next Oni Guard. The Sea of Seclusion and its three surrounding islands, inhabited by leaping half-skeleton spiders that'll rob your ass of all your Okani when it lands atop you, Oni warriors with clubs, fire-flinging living hands that rise from the ground, two secret Oni guards for extra cash, and even miniature octopi, shrimps, and rising tentacles underwater, followed by a dance number at the Ryugu Palace, complete with a guessing minigame no less, upon buying and saving an isolated turtle from a trio of douchey-ass alien-like sea demons. <laughs> who then awards Tarosuke a gift box containing either extra cash, or even worse, the curse of rapid aging. Christ, ghouls and ghosts much? Oh, and this is where the nymph feces comes in, by the way. The Valley of Judgment, where the actual, if euphemistic to some degree, shit starts to hit the goddamn fan in a way no one's ever fathomed, there are three demonic boss adversaries you have to go up against and take down in order to get three elemental stones, a living cycloptic demon tree, a flame-based demon bathing in lava, and even a living rock statue whose head floats around as it spits out stone bombs, all before granting permission from both the Sanzu River Witch. And the all-knowing Enma to enter, drumroll please. The world of Samsara, where you're strictly, and I do mean strictly, forbidden from killing anyone or snatching up any moolah, which of course will savagely deduct your piety points and affect your overall outcome, hence where those five fateful endings come in, and where our next topic is involved, in conjunction with receiving the best ending possible. Beyond everything else, the controls are rather slippery and antsy at times, especially when attempting to maintain Tarosuke's balance between gaps, and even during the prayer endurance trials at the temples, but not so much while waiting around atop any water surface or deep underneath, and the gameplay framework doesn't take an extraordinarily long time or a massive deal of effort to allow it all to sink in whatsoever. Not gonna fucking lie there. Concerning Yokai no Chuki's challenge, as fair as this game is, I wouldn't so much as expect it to kiss my ass every step of the way, as it'll roast you worse than those two Middle Easterner co-workers from the 40-year-old virgin, and haunt your fantasies more dreadfully than Credence Leonor Gilgood from the infamous Troll 2. Getting back to areas 2, 3, and 4, I don't even need to repeat myself about how crucial it is to keep your wits about you when standing your ground against every terrifying-ass adversary, and especially save up as much cash as possible to either purchase extra items or donate for one of your three desired enhancement prayers at the temples. In the latter case, you're best off donating no less than 5,000 before the inaugural button-mashing endurance trial, since there are higher points in certain stage areas where the high jumps are necessary to reach the extra cash items or clear wider gaps. Not only that, even if you didn't have enough cash for a specific necessity, you'd be left with no other alternative but to tediously grind your ass off for minutes on end before proceeding. And to top it all off, since there's also an ass load of hidden surprise areas to explore, it's up to your own fucking curiosity and wits alone to do so, depending on how much piety and cash you attempt to maintain a steady balance between, amongst everything else, like the half-naked bather girl, who'll invite you to the heavens with even more cash depending on your piety points, or will turn into a burly muscle man and boot your ass out while dumping turds all over. Talk about literal bullshit, right? especially in the fifth and final area, the aforementioned world of Samsara, before approaching Yama where, for the last fucking time, you're prohibited from killing anyone and or anything off, or nabbing any cash. Granted, it's still a bitch that you have to endure at least a hit or two when avoiding both the familiar enemies and hazards alike, the latter including the usual corpse-filled chasms and tumbling boulders, but it's the piety points that are the main concern which will determine Tarosuke's ultimate fate on behalf of the Buddhist deity Yama, hence that mandatory stipulation. Beyond all those, please refer back to what I mentioned regarding the infinite continues available upon every death, despite the strictest shit 3000 piety point deduction imposed, and take every mandatory hint to heart if you're willing to see Tarosuke in his most hopeful and fulfilled outcomes known to all mankind, and in his case, ghost kind.
on the graphical forefront, as opposed to both its arcade parent and its much favored sibling variant of a PC Engine or TurboGrafx-16 to us Promised Land folk, port, and notwithstanding how dramatically downgraded the presentation is, is at least tolerable enough to recognize everything one might expect, even if it's inspired by Japanese mythology, hence this game's intended vibe, of course. Most of the varying afterlife scenes Tarosuke roams through are nothing short of invigorating and, at times, barren, especially in the caves and underground sections of mountains, no less. It should also go without noting that there's alternate paths in the four remaining areas, unlike in both the aforementioned arcade parent and PC Engine sibling port, thereby expanding the game beyond expectations and abandoning the linear setup altogether. Tarosuke by himself, as minimal as his appearance is, is nothing short of charming. Ditto for his exoplasmic sidekick Monwa Taro, summoned only when facing the Oni Guards. Granted, he's no Kirby, Link, Ash, aka Satoshi, Kid Chameleon, Alex Kidd, Mega Man, Astro Boy, or God forbid, Eric Cartman, or any pint-sized character that's been transcending history, but holy fucking shit does he rank up there. Every common adversary, regardless of stature or origin, is nothing short of menacing, considering how bland they appear, and in the case of the supporting characters, when Taro Suke comes face to face with them, starting with Ganta, and even the old but generous Jigoku Shop Lady Owner, the Temple Priest, the Half-Owl Innkeeper, the Half-Nude Bathers, and the Ryugu Palace's Burlesque Dancer, the Kidnapped Turtle, the Sanzu River Witch, Enma, and especially Yama, they're all very eccentric and idiosyncratic in their own right. I mean, hell, even at this point, I see no reason in proceeding any further. Or do I? In terms of music and sound, orchestrated by Naomi Ide, under the alias Joyful Ide, and Masakatsu Maikawa, under the alias Hiroshi Maikawa, in collaboration with Haruo Ohari, under the alias Distortion Ohari, and Gama Imi, with the latter two handling the PCM samples, based on Hiroyuki Kawada's original arcade soundtrack, the minimal yet predominant choice of themes are bouncy and upbeat, in spite of how they'll lose their spark after at least the second or third areas, specifically the main spirit world themes, visiting the mini casino set up by the Toad Bouncer, Jigoku Shops and Temples, and even facing the Oni Guards. The remaining fraction of the themes also possess their idiosyncratic, albeit somehow tense, vibes, no matter what situation Taro Suke's in. The participating sound effects, as repetitious as they are, are at least suitable and appropriate for each in-game situation, including but not limited to when Taro Suke fires off his spiritual key bullets, takes damage, and the random frags that rib it every time they descend, some of which are Delta Pulse called modulated, by the way. But yeah, all arbitrary tech jargon aside. Replayability-wise, due as a whole to those alternate paths I outlined a while ago, not to mention the multiple endings, amongst a select few other innovations this game introduced, which, yet again, I'm in no position to recap at this juncture, except for the Temple Prayer Endurances to level up Taro Suke's Key Bullets, Jumping Ability, or Spirits for extra piety points, and given the fact that it's inspired by ancient Japanese mythology, which, as per usual, is right up my motherfucking alley, it should be obvious why it still remains heralded as one of Bandai Namco's more notable titles in that country. Japan, that is. Well, at least there as opposed to the rest of the world, despite the latter giving it slightly more acclaim. In addition, while it's not for everyone, and despite the plain-ass fact that no one will comprehend the deep, dark atmosphere it brings, or why there wasn't enough to bring to the table unlike everything else at the time, I for one intend to keep shifting souls into Yokai Dojuki, aka the Spirit Travel Journal, Phantom Travel Journal, Shadowland, no matter which way you slice it, every now and again, regardless of what the fucking Christ anyone believes. And one day, maybe it's more favorite arcade parent and PC Engine, aka TurboGrafx-16, counterparts. Before I wrap this all up, don't think or assume for one second I'm not aware that there's translation patches of Yokai Dochuki, notwithstanding the usual meticulous deal of effort I made in providing said translations through titling, I might add, throughout the review.
Henceforth, what's my final verdict? It should come as no surprise how far this game has come, not only being mostly recognized in Japan, but worldwide also as mentioned earlier, and that it's been examined many a time before now due to what the fuck I've been yapping my ass off about thus far. Bottom line, you'd be off your goddamn hinges to even consider leaving this game out in the cold, as it'll give you more bang for your buck and then some, considering how cheap both of the ports are. Cases in point, the Famicom port will run you only 9 bucks loose, or approximately that same price, up to 30 bucks, complete in box or new, whereas the PC Engine, aka TurboGrafx-16 port, will run you only 15 bucks loose, or between 33 to 66 bucks, complete in box or new. Trust me, it'll make you change your overall perspective on why the world missed out on such extraordinary and complex games like this. And in the words of the late great Justin Carmichael, alias Jew Wario, either game is worth getting and playing. It's challenging enough to make you just curse, no pun intended, but entertaining enough to make you keep on wanting to play it. Until then, my always trusted pack, this is the one and only Hardcore Retro God triumphantly signing off.